as academics, especially in the arts and humanities, begin to adopt markdown-based workflows, they begin to raise questions that boil all down to this central one. Is there more I can do to make my work even more efficient? And of course, yes, there is. In the last weeks, more and more people were asking me, so how does Git work? Because as people begin to explore the vast resources on the internet, one of the first terms they will stumble upon is Git, being praised as the go-to solution for software development as it allows you to micromanage all your files. So in this video, I want to offer a short explainer of what Git is and, more specifically, how Git can help you as a researcher. Git is a command line program, similar to Pandoc, which most of you might already be familiar with. This means to operate it, you'll need to open up that old-school black and white terminal application on your computer. There are some programs that allow you to control Git via a graphical user interface, but I won't tackle these in this video. Released in 2005, Git was the solution for software developers who wanted a way to track changes to their source code. Because if something went wrong, they could then simply go back to a version of the code which worked and see where the mistakes started to happen. But Git can also be used for a variety of other things, because Git does not care if the files are software code or markdown. You could even track changes to binary files such as images or Word documents, but more on that later. To understand what Git does, let us begin with a part of your workflow that you likely encountered several times, be it your own doing or someone else's. Many academic projects look like this. You have files named project.docx, project.v2.docx, project.3.docx or project.finalfinal.docx. We all know how this goes and nobody can really say they like it. It clutters whole folders and finding the most recent version can be tricky if you don't stick to one certain system of naming different versions. Wouldn't it be great if you could turn this mess simply into this? This is precisely what Git does. So what is happening here? Well, Git does also track version changes, but it keeps them hidden because what you care about is only one version at a time. If you want to take a look at an older version, you can tell Git to show you that one instead. The beauty of this approach is that it enables you not only to have multiple versions of files on your computer, but you only see the relevant one. Of course, this makes even more sense if you have multiple files. For instance, imagine a paper project where you have some notes, a to-do list, some images and a data file. Whenever you proceed in your data analysis, the paper is also likely going to change as well as the image files. But at a certain point, you will be happy with your progress and go to bed to continue working on it the next day. Git allows you to take a snapshot of the state your project is currently in and securely store it. After you have taken such a snapshot, no matter what you do to your files, the snapshot will make sure you can at any time revert back to a previous version of them. Using Git enables you to radically change every single bit of your paper without hesitation because you can be sure that you are able to restore it within seconds. So after outlining the benefits Git may have, let's see how it actually works. Git always works with directories. You cannot use it on single files. But as most of your projects almost by default will require more than one file, this is fine. First, you will need to tell Git to treat a certain directory as a so-called Git repository. You do this by navigating into the directory and executing git init. This will create a directory called .git. The dot in front of the name prevents this from showing up on most operating systems. Make sure you never delete this if you do not want to lose all the history. Now add some files, for instance a markdown file for your paper, some figures you'd like to include, maybe a references database. Then. You can tell Git to monitor these files by executing git add asterisk. You can choose which files to track via Git, but for academic projects make sure to simply track all files. Selective file tracking is something software developers need and not necessarily academics. We don't want to overly complicate things here. Now you'll need a third command in order to actually persist the changes. That is, take a snapshot. You can do so using git commit. Commit does mean precisely that, you commit to the way your files look at this very moment. Just as you can't really change any analog photography after it has been taken, this commit will stay like this forever. If you commit something, Git will take your files in that state and store them safely in the Git directory. Last but not least, modify the files again. Add some paragraphs or, as I have mentioned previously, remove some sections you don't like anymore. Now you can again commit these files, that is, take a snapshot. So run git commit again and what git will do is take the current state of that directory again 
and place it on top of the previous snapshot. If you've added some files, you need to tell git to track the changes to these files as well by running git add asterisk again. If you continue this, you will notice that the history of that directory looks a lot like sediments. Old history is buried under numerous layers of states your project was in during the period of writing. Now, let us assume you just had a talk with your supervisor and she told you of a great angle you could tackle the research question from and you just remembered that you already did this but trashed the idea because you thought it was not feasible. If you took snapshots using Git, you have the ability to browse through all of these snapshots and look for the one you need. On the images I have shown you thus far in the video, you may have noticed this blue arrow. This is called a pointer and Git internally uses these to remember where in history you currently are. Imagine a small table calendar where you can move back and forth the window which surrounds the current day. All other days are also there, but the current one is indicated with a red frame. Whatever is inside this red frame is what Git will show you. This is by default always the topmost layer. If you want to peek into an older layer, it is as simple as moving this red frame to the layer you want to look at. In Git, the corresponding command for that is git checkout. Whatever you type after checkout will be what Git shows you. But what do you need to check out to? Well, each of these layers receives a unique identification and by telling Git this unique identification, it will know which snapshot you want to look at right now. To see all your snapshots, the easiest way is to execute the command git log. To make it more compact, you can use the one line flag, which will, as it indicates, display every comment using only one single line. The lines begin with the unique identification git needs, followed by the message you attached to the snapshot. Because yes, you can and should put some notes into your snapshots. These help you find the correct snapshot at a later time. Simply copy the respective ID, for instance A9E9D12 and then run git checkout, passing this. If you now take a look at the directory, it will look totally different. This is because git has behind the scenes taken all the files of that snapshot and placed them in the directory for you. Now you can browse these files and open them. As soon as you find the information you were looking for, simply copy it out of the directory, that is, copy the paragraph into a new document, and then execute git checkout master. This command will tell git that you have found what you are looking for and you are ready to work on your project again. Note that while you are looking through the different snapshots, any changes to any file will be lost after you go back to the editable state. Browsing these snapshots is only to look for lost information. If you want to copy some old information to your current working directory, that is the topmost layer, you'll need to copy that out of the directory and then switch back to the topmost layer. Git also has a lot of other benefits, such as displaying the changes between two snapshots, but we won't cover them in this video. However, one thing I would like to tackle before I let you experiment with Git is a question that has likely popped up by now. If Git allows me to store the exact state of my files in the directory, doesn't this mean that after 10 snapshots I will have the directory 10 times? And if I have a lot of files, won't I run out of disk space super fast? To this the answer is clearly no, but with a small caveat. Git is clever enough to see what exactly you changed in a text file. If you add a paragraph to a markdown document, what Git will store is only the contents of that paragraph and the information where the paragraph is added, for instance on line 24. It will not store the whole file again, only what is called the difference or short diff. The caveat, however, is binary files. Any file that is not in a text format will cause ever so slight problems. Binary files are things such as images or Excel spreadsheets, but also Word documents are binary files because you cannot view them in a text editor. Git can only store binary files for all or nothing. So as soon as a binary file changes, no matter how marginal the change was, Git will store that whole file again. If nothing changes, it will simply retain the old file. For your academic work this means, imagine it like the way I explained what Git does at the beginning of this video. Concerning binary files, Git actually has to create multiple copies of the file and name them with some suffix such as final, final final or really final. Git was originally created for software development, but it is about time that academics makes use of this unique benefits as well. It fits well into the academic workflow and it has a lot of features I did not mention in this video. Because all you are ever going to need to work productively are the five commands I have mentioned in this short introduction. Let's quickly recap them. With git init, 
you tell Git that you would like to be able to take snapshots in a given directory. Whenever you add files that Git does not already watch, you need to run git add asterisk in order to tell Git that there are new files that you need to keep track of. If you want to stop work or if you are about to make a big change, run git commit hyphen m message to tell Git it should take the files and safely store them. Make sure to add a descriptive note to the snapshot so you can find it again in the future. To see all your previous snapshots in a compact list, use the command git log one line. You can leave out the one line to have Git display the snapshots with more spacing and a more generous layout. Git will modify the directory to show you a certain snapshot by running the command git checkout identifier, where this identifier is the string of numbers and letters in front of the snapshot node when you run git log. To be able to edit your files again, that is, to move back to the most recent version, simply run git checkout master. There is one last command I did not mention in this video, which will give you more information about the directory, which is called git status. Git status will tell you, for instance, what files have been modified at the moment and if it found files that it does not track. If git tells you there are modified files, simply run git commit to take a snapshot and make the directory clean again, so to speak. And if git tells you there are untracked files, simply run git add asterisk to add them to git. And there you have it. All you ever need to know for making sure your projects are both clutter-free and safe forever. Git is something academics can really profit from and I hope in this video I could break down the power of Git well enough so that its benefits have become clear. If not, feel free to leave a comment and as always make sure to like and subscribe. For those of you who are interested in learning more, I've compiled a list of resources down in the description for further reading. Thanks for watching.